Hi, welcome back. All right, so what we've been talking about in the last few videos, um, depending on in which playlist you're watching this, because I have it in both, we've been talking about uh, peptide chains, peptide bonds and so forth, and then we've also in other playlists talk, talk, been talking about carbohydrates and how they work and what they do and so forth. And it turns out in biology, we can actually have certain moieties that are part protein and part carbohydrate. We can also have things that are part lipid and part carbohydrate. Some things are part lipid and part protein. We can make combinations of, di of different uh, types of biomolecules. And one of the best examples of this is something called peptidoglycan. All right, so what is peptidoglycan? Well, peptido, the prefix peptide, should tell you that there's a protein part of it, and there is. The glycan, glycan tends to refer to um, longer chains of carbohydrates, and it, this in fact does happen. The glycan component is really not going to be the focus of this video, um, even though this is that's technically a carbohydrate part, and this video doesn't really have anything to do with that. I still have thrown it in the carbohydrate playlist because peptidoglycan does have that. Um, if you're curious about peptidoglycan more, make sure to watch the lysozyme video. In this video, we're going to focus more on the peptide part, but it's still very interesting. So peptidoglycan is a protective layer of bacterial cell walls. Okay, So bacteria, without their cell walls and without this peptidoglycan, they would be very vulnerable to the outside environment. Okay, They wouldn't be really protected at all, and they would be killed very easily. So the peptidoglycan layer is, is it's, um, a part protein, part carbohydrate, and it protects, the out, it protects the bacteria from the outside environment. Okay? It makes them much, much more durable. And it's actually going to take a lot more work to kill them um, because they have this in their cell walls. Okay? Now, in uh, one of the world wars, and I believe it was World War I, someone in the comments, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, in World War I, um, this is one of, the, one of the most violent wars we've seen up to this point. I think the Civil War was a violent war in the United States. Um, but the World War, war, world war I excuse me, was very, very bloody. And you have people that get shot in certain parts of their body, and they initially live. right? Now, before World War I, we had no way to combat disease associated with you know, getting shot. So if someone gets shot in the leg, right? The only option for that person was literally to get their leg amputated. And even with that, there's not a huge probability that they'd live. Um, when you get shot with a bullet, um, that you get huge amounts of bacterial infection, and it's actually that that can ultimately kill you. So around the time of World War I, there was a scientist who actually um, discovered this compound that was produced um, by some organism, and it's called a penicillin. So what penicillin does is it actually helps to kill bacteria, okay? Penicillin helps to kill bacteria. So right here on the left side of the screen, right up here, this is an example of a penicillin. Why is it a penicillin? Well, penicillin is not itself a molecule. There are different penicillins, and each one is designated by the identity of this R group. So you can change this R group, and it'll be a different penicillin. But this particular scientist discovered penicillin, and he noticed that any place there was penicillin, there was no bacterial growth. So he thought, well, maybe the penicillin kills the bacteria, and it turns out he was right. So what they started doing when people got shot or injured in the World War I is they would give them penicillin, and it would actually increase the survival rate because they weren't getting anywhere close to the same severity of the bacterial infection, so it actually helped people. So back, how, does, how does penicillin actually um, kill bacteria? Well, what penicillin does is it targets an enzyme in peptidoglycan synthesis, and it inhibits it permanently. That enzyme is known as transpeptidase. Okay? So what is transpeptidase, briefly? So right here on the, on the right side, you have a growing peptidoglycan peptide chain. Okay, so in order to make peptidoglycan strong and durable, you can't just make individual peptide chains. You actually have to cross-link them. So in other words, it's sort of like if you um, if you had three, if you had like well, not three. Let's say you had. Um, I'll I'll draw a picture too. Let's say you had some vertical bars like this. Okay, vertical bars. So they're just independent of each other. 
They're not that strong when they're like this, but if I now connect them horizontally, now it's overall much stronger because I've cross-linked all of them. So that's essentially what this enzyme transpeptidase does, is it cross-links the growing peptide chains of peptidoglycan and drastically increases the stability and strength of the cell wall. So we're going to look at a more of a mechanistic approach, and it's a simplified mechanism, but we're going to see how, peptidogl or how penicillins inhibit it, but to understand that, we have to look at how transpeptidase works because penicillin inhibits transpeptidase. And I've abbreviated transpeptidase as E for enzyme. So here's the enzyme right here. The enzyme is going to attack this carbonyl, and it's going to kick off this moiety over here. So what is this moiety exactly? It's actually alanine, but it's a special kind. It's actually D-alanine, the D-isomer. Bacteria can actually use D-alanine for this purpose. And when the enzyme attacks right here, you actually get an enzyme linkage between um, the growing peptide chain and transpeptidase. There's actually a linkage here, see? And then there's this other growing peptide chain, and this glycine free amine is going to now attack the carbonyl and kick off the enzyme. And so what you ultimately get is a cross-linked peptide. Okay? Again, it's an oversimplified version of the mechanism, but this is how it works. Essentially, this nitrogen right here is going to get connected to this carbonyl, and you've effectively cross-linked the peptide chains. Okay? So one of the things about the penicillins is, in certain ways, they resemble this growing peptide chain. So notice I have this nitrogen right there. I have a nitrogen right there. I haven't indicated it here, but part of this lysine right here is actually the, the C-terminus part of the lysine. So actually, you would actually see a carbonyl right there. That's the peptide bond that connects to this lysine. And sure enough, you see that carbonyl right there. Um, some other things, you have a hydrogen here and a carbonous group right there. You have that right here. I also have this carbonyl right there. I have it right there. I have the nitrogen, the nitrogen. So this part of the molecule over here really resembles um, the growing peptide chain. And in fact, also another thing I can point out, this carboxyl group also is part of that. Okay, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of similarities between penicillin and this component of the growing peptide chain. Okay, so just like in the case of the normal mechanism for bacteria, the enzyme transpeptidase attacks this carbonyl, it's going to attack this carbonyl too. And just like in the case of kicking off the nitrogen, it kicks off the nitrogen. And so what you get is this right here. So the enzyme is now covalently attached, right? See, it attacks here. So the enzyme is now attached to that carbonyl, and now effectively you have this nitrogen that has left. It's now separated, okay? But it turns out that because of this bulky group right here, this big group, that this peptide chain right here, this other peptide chain that wants to cross-link, it's blocked. Okay, this is a pretty bulky group right here, and it turns out that this enzyme penicillin complex right here completely inactivates the enzyme. Okay? So now that this enzyme, the enzyme transpeptidase is linked here, this other growing peptide chain cannot attach right here. And so because of that, you can't form those cross links anymore between the, between the peptide chains. So the peptidoglycan becomes weak, and the bacteria become much more vulnerable, and other bodily defenses are much more easily able to kill them. So, in, in other words, it's not directly bactericidal, it's, it's more bacteriostatic, but it weakens them enough to where they die, they're able to be killed. Okay, so by, by disrupting the peptidoglycan and making it much weaker, because they can't cross-link, it makes the bacteria much more vulnerable, and they are a, more easily able to be killed. Okay, so penicillins, they, they are technically a drug, they're natural molecules, made by certain things like fungus, or fungi, I should say, excuse me. Um, but we're able to actually use them in, in, um, as, a, as a drug. And so what they're actually doing is they are covalently inactivating the enzyme transpeptidase. In other words, what they're actually doing, even though they're real biomolecules, they're actually irreversible inhibitors or suicide inhibitors. They're killing transpeptidase's activity completely 
making an inactive enzyme penicillin complex. So this, this no longer works, and any step after this it can't do because the enzyme is completely stalled. Okay, so that is how penicillin, that's its mechanism of inhibiting transpeptidase and peptidoglycan synthesis. So hopefully this video made a little bit of sense. Make sure to watch this video and or make sure to like this video, excuse me, and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.